Welcome to State and Fig, located in historic La Arcata Plaza in downtown Santa Barbara. Our menu focuses on products that are raised in the state of California, inspired by the flavors of the Riviera. And we are proud to be sponsoring this program. I'm attorney Gregory Lowe. I will prepare your trust, bankruptcy, divorce, conservatorship, probate, evictions. All of this I can do at an affordable price and with caring. Thank you very much. When I was growing up as a kid, I used to go around with him and watch him. My mother and I both worked at Lowry Field to keep on doing this together. Get Conscious Now is proud to be sponsored by American Riviera Bank. It's our bank, and we feel good about it. Hi, I'm Kelly Brandenburg. I've been a stylist for the last 15 years. I'm a color specialist as well as I provide a wide variety of other services. You can find me at 19 Blue Salon in the heart of downtown. I'm happy to be a sponsor of Get Conscious Now. Hello, I'm Patricia DiOrio and this is Get Conscious Now. This television show is about raising our awareness about what it means to be conscious in a world that is primarily unconscious and unaware of our true nature as energy beings in physical form and creators of our reality. Today's episode is about conscious sexuality, a topic that is very, very important and vital to understanding our human experience on every level. However, it's still considered pretty much of a taboo conversation in society at large. Well, hang on to your hats. This show is going to rock you because it's going to help you understand and move past the limiting beliefs that we have about sexuality and the sexual status quo. So stay tuned and be prepared to be stretching your thoughts and getting out of your comfort zone. But first, I'd like to introduce, I'm always happy to introduce, my co-host, my partner, and my accomplice in bringing you unconventional programming on Get Conscious Now. He is Stu Zimmerman, fun, funny, and always on the top of his game. Stu, do you have some words of welcome? I do. And first of all, thank you, Patricia, You're as welcome. always, for uh, being my partner in grime in this. This in is so beautiful. Partner in grime? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, welcome everybody to another edition of Get Conscious Now. It is absolutely a pleasure to be here, and that is actually part of the consciousness. It's simply a pleasure to be, and to be here now. And what a beautiful time it is simply to be alive. Now, if you've missed any of our programs to date, you know, we have almost 20 of them now at this point in the library. So please come to our website at getconsciousnow.com or to YouTube, and we have a Get Conscious Now channel. So we've had people like Deepak Chopra, Reverend Michael Beckwith, and a host of other incredibly uh, insightful and forward-thinking people that make for a, not only a delightful conversation, but also helps us to wake up a little bit. And so uh, I know Patricia mentioned, you know, keep your hat on. Well, I'm inviting you to talk, toss your hat in the ring on this one because we are all in this together. And Patricia, why don't you introduce our guest? I'm happy to do that. Um, so true confessions to begin with. I was raised in the two decades following World War II, I'm aging myself here, uh, in a family that was middle class, ethnic, very conservative, and very Catholic, if you get the picture. The conversation around sexuality in my family was verbally non-existent, but energetically it was repressed, suppressed, and taboo. And unfortunately, this is really the case with most families today in the world. Our guest is passionately committing, committed to shifting this paradigm around sexuality. She is Amy Jo Goddard, a sexual empowerment coach and an expert in helping people, guiding people, to become fulfilled and whole in their sexuality as well as in all other areas of their lives. 
She has a very impressive vitae, and I'd like to just cover a few points right now. She's a graduate of UCSB, I was surprised to find that out, where she actually got inspired around the human sexuality education conversation. She earned her master's degree at NYU in human sexuality education, and uh, has, for the past 20 years, been an expert in the field of sexuality. In March of 2014, she delivered her TED Talk to a large audience in Napa Valley, and it was on owning your sexual power. She was also named uh, one of 100 women in Go Magazine, the women we love the most, I believe was the, was the title. And she is now coming out with her second book, which will be released in September. And let's see if I can get this title correct. It is Woman on Fire, Nine Elements to Wake Up Your Erotic Energy, Your Personal Power, and your sexual intelligence. So we're really thrilled to have Amy Jo Goddard on our show today. Thank you, Amy, for being here. Really, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Great to be here. Yes, Amy Jo, thank you. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to kick off the interview by asking you to share your story, which led you to actually this very unusual line of work. Yeah, you know, my yeah. story is not uh, unlike yours uh, in the sense that I grew up in a family where no one talked about sex. Um, I grew up in a military family with a single parent father. And um, there was just no conversation about sex. There were parts of my life, like really crucial parts of my life where I lived thousands and thousands of miles away from my mother. And so, and there wasn't, she was kind of a recovering Catholic. And, you know, so I kind of had, had those things at work in the context of, of what happened in my family. Um, and so I really had to figure things out myself and it was not easy and I went through a lot of difficult experiences with sexuality that had I actually had good information about it, um, had I had adults that I could really talk to about it, would have been very, very different. Um, and, you know, my parents did the best they could, as most parents do, but we don't really, you know, I work with adults now, and it's so funny when, when people hear that I'm a sex educator, they think like, oh, so do you work with teenagers? You know, because clearly teenagers are the, are the only people who need <laughs> sex ed. And I say, no, I work, with, I work with former teenagers who never got the sex ed they needed when they were young, and then we turn into adults, and suddenly we're supposed to understand sexuality and you know, know how to communicate and know how to have a, a healthy relationship and you know, where do we really learn those skills? Um, so I actually, my, my fire was really lit at UCSB um, with John and Janice Baldwin. Anyone who has uh, been a part of the UCSB community probably knows who they are. They were just terrific sex educators and my mind was blown and it just, it woke me up and I started on my own path of of sexual empowerment at that time and then became a feminist activist and did a lot of work around the body, around sexual assault issues, around issues of reproductive health and justice. And that ultimately led to me wanting to put all of that together, knowing I really wanted to do something that would empower in particular women and girls um, and that the doorway for that really was sexuality. So I've been on that mission ever since. <laughs> Great. Well, we're, we're so glad you're here because, as, as Patricia mentioned in the opening, you know, there is a bit of a taboo in, in talking about sexuality and consciousness and somehow putting them together. In fact, I just love the idea of putting your t-shirt together with our logo here and get sexual conscious evolution now, now. <laughs> Double now. Double now. Exactly. Double that now. So how, you know, you kind of give us a little bit of background, but what exactly is a sexual empowerment coach? Like what kind of role did you play? And, and did you make up that name yourself or that title yourself? Or has that been out there? Yeah, I believe that I was the first one to coin it as far as I know. And, um, you know, when I really started to look at what is it that I'm doing with people, that's, that's what I'm doing. And it isn't, you know, as you said in the intro, it's not just about people being able to have great orgasms or great sex or be able to talk about it. That's a piece of it, you know, but it really is about how people are living their lives. And that's where the title of my book came from because it's so much about how people actually step into their personal power. And a lot of times, you know, I primarily work with women at this phase of my career, um, sometimes with couples, but 
what I hear a lot is that women, the women that I'm working with are very powerful in certain ways in their lives. They're very self-actualized in many ways. They've done a lot of work in terms of their career. Um, they've developed a family. They're doing creative work that is really important to them. And then this is the piece that kind of just gets suppressed and pushed under the rug and not dealt with. And so a lot of times when women come to me, what they'll say is, you know, this is the piece I haven't worked on yet. And I, I know that there's a key in terms of, you know, my wholeness, my, my kind of my growth, my own personal development that really is in my sexuality. And it's time to really address mm -hmm. that. So um, empowerment really is the word that encapsulates that. I love the word evolution, sexual evolution. Mm -hmm. you know, I hadn't heard that term before, you know, conscious evolution and we're an evolving humanity, but sexual evolution, it makes total, total sense. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree with you. I think that this is an aspect of our lives, of women's lives especially, where we have not really learned about it, developed it, owned it, and really and realized that it's such a big part of our personal power. Mm -hmm. you know, so I really appreciate the work you're doing. So you wrote a manifesto called The Five Stages, Sexual Evolution, The Five Stages of Sexual Need. Could you give us a brief synopsis of that? Well, Is possible? The, the idea with uh, looking at the, the five levels of sexual need was, you know, I, I, I taught college students for a lot of years and I worked a lot with, with Maslow's theory, uh, um, the hierarchy of needs, which is a, you know, a fundamental theory in, in psychology if you study psychology. And so I started looking at, well, if we, if we put a, a sexual lens on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, what would that look like? Um, and so the idea is that um, when we're at the lower phases of sort of like his, his pyramid of needs, those are the, the things we need to meet first. So, um, so physiological needs, you know, at the base and then, you know, working up through, you know, uh, self-esteem, um, love and belonging, actually, no, security, you know, then self-esteem and love and belonging and then all the way up to self-actualization. So, um, the idea being that if we don't kind of address the, the, the base of the pyramid, it's hard to really get to that full self-actualization. When I, when I started thinking about it with sexuality, what came to me was that people a lot of times, and, and sometimes in relationship where we're missing each other, the thing that's happening is that we have a different need. There's a different need that's being met. So one person might be in the place of, Sex meets a physical need for me. It is a physical release. It is a stress reduction. It is a part of my daily maintenance, and it is something that I need. You know, that might that can be a worldview about sexuality or an approach to a sexual need. And there's an, absolutely nothing wrong with that approach. But sometimes that person will be in a relationship with someone whose self-esteem needs get really met through sexuality and sexual expression, and so then they're showing up maybe in a different way uh, or someone might have you know more of that love and belonging piece or that that security piece of like when we're connected sexually i feel more secure right or when we're more connected sexually i i feel really loved in the world and i'm really connected to love so you know there's a lot we could extrapolate upon uh in terms of those things but i think that we show up in those different needs and we might show up in those different needs at different on different days of, or different weeks, um, in different relationships with different people. Um, but ultimately, I think sexuality does have that transformative power, um, that top place of the pyramid of, of that self-actualization. And I think when people really fully step into their sexual power and really are confident and at home in their sexuality, that's when that real full transformation and self-actualization can occur. And I think if we try to do it without bringing our sexuality with us, we're going to get tripped up. There's still mm -hmm. going to be a huge piece of us that's missing. And, um, and so usually that's when I get people. You know, they come to me when they're like, uh, this is that piece that I still really need and really want. So. So, so what does that look like for you? Because, as, you know, you're a great example of... Uh, going on this journey and this exploration into sexual evolution. So what does your personal evolution look like and how do you characterize your sexuality? Oh, so many different ways. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am very out as a queer person. Uh, I identify as, as queer. Um, my first book was called Lesbian Sex Secrets for Men. So I wrote that book from for a male audience 
uh, although and I think a lot of women read the book as well, um, from a perspective of a woman who partners with other women. Um, I partner with other queer people and there's sort of other layers to that in terms of identity and in terms of me feeling like I have a very politicized identity around sexuality. Um, and then I also identify as a, a polyamorous person, um, which means that I'm not I'm not in a monogamous kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. I have different lovers and different people that I have a deep and intimate connection to. Um, and that's been a really important part of my journey too, is really figuring out that the model of monogamy is not the thing that works for me. Mm -hmm. It works for some people. And, and I, don't, I don't have judgments about that. I think when, when people find that that's what works and that's what they need, then that's great. But I think a lot of times what's happening is we're trying to fit ourselves into a relationship model that doesn't actually work, and then we end up frustrated, you know, or two people have very <clears throat> different ideas of what they need in terms of that. Well, that whole notion of being polyamorous, which clearly is a contrast to monogamy, can be really threatening yep. to one's ego as well as to one's pos potentially, you know, social position and everything because all people go into kinds of judgment yep. uh, around that. So I can imagine that has been a, a difficult trail at times. Yeah. We're talking about yeah. sexual evolution, yeah. right? Yes. So that that would be a part of it, in, you know, in my understanding. Not that everyone has to abide by it or participate in it. It really depends on, yeah. you know, where, where they are. I think the piece around it is that, is for people to understand that there are, are choices for how they get to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think what I've seen a lot is that, is that people learn this very narrow idea of what their sexual expression needs to look like. And, and then they just go along with the program Mm -hmm. And then at some point, there are maybe discomforts or things that aren't working or things go wonky in a relationship and they're, kind of, they're not sure why. Um, and sometimes people will stay in that and stay really frustrated for a long time. And then sometimes it's just really about the exploration of like, well, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not cut out for the thing I've been told I'm supposed to be. And I think that's a big part of anyone's sexual evolution process mm -hmm. is, to, is to figure out like what's really true for me, what's really sexually authentic for me um, and to live that in a world where we haven't the world hasn't quite caught up yet you know and so I think that's part of what's hard yeah. uh, about that and so for me it's important to be very out in, in mm. these ways well you know last night so interestingly you were watching the Bill Maher show uh, and there was a woman on there that has a show on MSNBC and she um, was transgender she, uh, transgender mm -hmm. right and beautiful I mean my goodness just gorgeous mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Bill Maher, he's such, a, he's such a card. So she was talking about all the different ways that we can, we can show up sexually in this, in this life, in this human experience. And he says, well, you know, I wouldn't be showing up with this, that, or the other thing. My, you know, he made a comment like that. And she said, but the thing is that we all have options. Mm -hmm. We can all make a choice mm -hmm. about what we want. Everybody yep. doesn't have to do yep. everything. You know, you can make a choice about what you feel comfortable doing. But I think the point more than anything else to me is that it's really important that we get out of our comfort zone around the possibilities of expanding our personal power through our sexuality. And I think that, you know, watching um, Eve Einsler for, with... Um, Eve Ensler. Eve Ensler with... Um, what was it? The, the vagina, vagina monologues. monologues. The vagina mm -hmm. monologues. I mean, it was awesome. The interviews that she did with women that were you know, considered senior citizens that had never even looked at their privates, never even mm. looked at them, let alone touched them. So that to me was just phenomenal. I think that was probably one of the first major events, her traveling around the country doing that and, and the video on it that really helped people get, you know, out of their comfort zone and into the possibility of, of options, having options, yeah. you know. So I was really surprised when we chatted on the phone this past week that you used the word queer. I don't know, to me, maybe it's my already always listening, as they call it, they say it in Landmark, you know, you're, you, always, you have an already always listening on the word queer being more of a pejorative or a derogatory term uh, than would be a descriptive term without any kind of charge associated with it. So I guess, and you also used the word kinky when we weren't speaking. So the word kinky and, and, and queer um, I, just tell me why you've chosen those words and um, what reaction you've gotten. I mean, that was my reaction. I'm very liberal and very open-minded, and I wasn't making a judgment whatsoever, but I thought, gosh, if I were doing your work, I don't know if I would use that word. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, there's been a there's there's a history now of uh, words that were once used in a derogatory way being taken back by the communities that they've been used against. Um, and queer is one of those words. Um, uh, it started in the 80s, actually in the late 80s, uh, a group called Queer Nation um, mm. started where they were choosing, they were doing a lot of activism, particularly around HIV um, and particularly around uh, a lot of issues in, uh, around gay men uh, and, and taking on sort of this <coughs> new, much more politicized identity where it's not about, you know, sometimes part of what you'll hear in queer and LGBT communities, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender communities uh, are uh, debates about sort of like what are the important issues. You know, some people think that working towards marriage is not the most important issue on the table. Um, Other people think that's really, really important, right? And so sometimes what gets talked about is that that might be a more, a, a way Uh, that for some people it can be about assimilating into the dominant culture um, and having the same rights and I think everyone should have the same rights I I feel like that just it shouldn't even be an issue like no one should be told who they get to marry Um, and at the same time there are other issues that are maybe more on the fringes that don't get talked about in mainstream media Um, and so a lot of people will take on more of that queer identity because of that politicization. Um, and to say it's not just, for me, I, I, I will say, it's not just about my sexuality, it's really about how I live my life. Of like, I'm not trying to fit into a particular uh, dominant norm or mainstream culture. I'm really being authentically who I am and showing up as that in the world. And my activism relates to that. So, so that's really, you know, I always say to people, if you ask 10 queers, how they define queer, you'll get 10 different answers. <laughs> so um, for me, that's what it is. Um, there's a lot of young people now who identify as queer. It's, it's become very, very commonplace, actually. Um, and it's a way of sort of not being so much in a box of like, well, are you lesbian or are you bisexual or are you, you know, it's mm. so there's just a lot of blurring of some of those lines and also just uh, embracing a lot of different genders. You know, we, we still talk about gender as if there are two and there are so many genders and we don't talk we about gender that We were talking about that, that last night in the show. Remember yeah. there were like, what, something like, was it 15,000? Codified, yeah. Like, so one, one group has identified 56 or something. Another one's grouped like a couple thousand. Mm-hmm. So a couple can, thousand you give us some, can you give us some examples of different types of genders beyond the two we're normally associating with? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of people who are really working to get beyond the gender binary. Um, right. And even when we talk about um, transgender people, talking about it as, oh, you're changing to the other one, that it's actually like, no, it's not that I'm changing to the other one. I'm something else entirely, you know, like, mm. like I'm, you know, and there's a, you'll hear also the term gender queer in uh, a lot of communities. So where people are like queering gender, they're playing with gender, they're getting outside of those like rigid binary roles of Mm. like this is a woman this is a man even if you just look at women people are very different women i'm a different woman from from the kind of woman you are we're we're different kinds of women um i identify as a woman um but some people don't some people don't identify as a woman or a man they identify as something else um and a lot of people are really bucking that idea that we have to be in this binary Mm -hmm. and i think that there's a lot for us to really learn about that and i think there's a lot of freedom for everybody if we could start to see it in that way. And even when we talk about biological sex, there's not just mm. two. There are many variations on even our bi- our biological sex, you know, whereas gender is more chosen and also learned culturally. You know, I, I really feel that given the fact that humanity is evolving, I mean, we're evolving as a humanity, mm-hmm. that we could very well, in light of this conversation, be evolving to the point of androgyny in a way where, you know, there it's it's not like really being aligned with the masculine or the feminine, but we're androgynous beings that can be multi-talented in a lot of different ways of expressing our sexuality. Mm-hmm. It seems to me that that's where we could be going. Yeah, there are a lot of people who um, identify as having no gender. I personally think that it's really hard to identify as having no gender because I think we live in a really gendered world. Um, and I think gender is fun. I think we, that we take gender too seriously sometimes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that if we could all actually have more fun with gender, it's actually really fun to play with. Um, and I think there's a lot we can learn about ourselves when we do that. But you know, many of us 
have learned very, we've all learned gender roles. We've all been sure. socialized um, based on usually our biological sex and then what our perceived gender uh, is. And, and how we were raised. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. Totally. So, so, so what do you see as the, as the implications for a relationship? Because you know, sexuality and relationship and kind of go hand in hand in many ways. What do you see in terms of relationship evolution as we you know, open up sexually? I mean, I think, I think a bit of what we were speaking about, that, that we begin to see relationship as something that we're really creating. And there's lots of different ways to create it. There's a lots of different ways to create family. You know, I have a poly family. I have people who are a part of my poly extended family. I have people who are my lovers. I have people who are playmates. I have, you know, their their people. You know, uh, the you know their their girlfriends or boyfriends or other lovers. You know, might be part of that family. Um, people do it in all different ways, um, but a lot of a, it. it gives us a lot of options for how we want to raise children and having more parents to like we're very over scheduled we've got a lot going on in our lives we are it takes a village away. it takes a village and yeah. why not create that you know uh uh one of my dear friends diana adams has done a lot of work around the legal sphere around uh creating more legal options for people to create families that are arranged very differently and i think we're going to see more about that um, I think that's kind of the next layer of, you know, we've been kind of doing the like same sex marriage thing for a while and that's, you know, we're still in that a bit mm -hmm. at this moment, you know, something happened in Texas this week, right, where it was like revoked um, when it has been passed. Uh, so I think, you know, we're still working on that, but I really think the next tier is just creating different relationship structures for people and whether it's legal or whether that's just how, I mean, people are living that way now. We just don't often know about it because a lot of times people are very in the closet about it. They feel mm. like, oh, well, I can't bring more than one partner home or I can't tell my family that there's this other person that's in our lives. Um, but there's a lot of different arrangements. And so I think it's, it's getting to decide how we, wanna, we want that to look and that it's not always going to be that typical, traditional mm -hmm. nuclear family. Right. So I enjoyed reading many of your articles, really fascinating stuff. And I was particularly intrigued by the one on uh, money and sexuality. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that relationship for a moment. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what is the connection between money and, sec and sexuality? There are many. Um, I really started on, you know, it's like I had really done this work on my own sexual empowerment. And I realized that at, after I went through my own uh, divorce from my partner of nine years that... Um, that I needed to figure out the money piece. And so I got really committed to that and finding mentors who could really help me with that. And I started to see how, how uh, aligned they are in terms of the energy we have around them, right? Mm -hmm. To me, they're the two things, they're the two biggest ways that we exchange energy, right? We, money exchanges hands every single day. Mm -hmm. It's a way like you give me something, I give you money to, to um, in exchange, right? Or vice versa. And so that's a way that we exchange money, or that we exchange energy all the time. Sex is obviously a huge way that we exchange energy, right? Um, money comes to us through our relationships, right? Yes. Um, sex is a huge part of our relationships, whether it's sex with the self or with others. So, um, you know, and I think that they are the two things that transform people's lives the most. When people step into their empowerment around sexuality, um, you know, really authentically, truly, and when they step into their empowerment financially, um, that changes our lives. It allows us to do, to be fully expressed in so many different ways. Um, you know, they're also the two things that are the most taboo, I think, still to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. They're certainly the two things that couples have the most trouble with. Mm. Um, when when yeah. things start to go wrong in, in a relationship, those are usually the two things that are most commonly uh, the root. Well, they're both second chakra. And they're both right there in the second right chakra. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So in fact, connected. it was kind of funny. You know, once upon a time, I used to be a money manager, and some of my uh, investors used to be more willing to talk to me about their sexuality yep. <laughs> than they were about their money. Yep. <laughs> and even that was a little bit too intimate. Interesting. So, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, the two intertwined is absolutely yeah. true. Mm -hmm. And I think that I think we tend to run the same energies with both. And mm -hmm. so I think when we really start to be honest with ourselves and look at 
You know, well, gosh, why don't I have enough money in my life? Oh, look, sexually, I have a really hard time receiving, you know. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think there's a lot of ways that our patterns show up in both um, because both of them are so much about giving and receiving. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, you know, I think they're both so much about being in this human body on earth at this time. Um, they're both very much about the physical world and how we can thrive in the physical world. So, I think if we start to really track how our patterns show up, we'll, we'll see them in both. Hmm. Now, I was really curious in our, uh, we, have, we have a call before our, our, our you know, for like the pre-show interview kind of thing. And uh, you described how you're continuing your evolution and, and pushing your own personal boundaries and envelope with uh, like, like 10 sexual activities that are new for you each year, like, like a New Year's resolution. Okay. Can, can you share a little bit both on how you came up with that and some of the places you've been or possibly could be going? <laughs> I hope you probably have a whole audience here and people watching all over the world. You know, but feel free to be, say what you can. I won't share some of it. I won't share all of it. Uh, fair some enough. Some of it's for me. But um, <laughs> yeah, you know, fair. a few years ago, I just, you know, I've been consciously single, like sovereign in my polyamory for about five years since I went through... Um, my divorce from my long-term relationship, um, which was still an open relationship, but it wasn't working the way I wanted it to. So I've been very consciously single um, and just getting to have things that I had set to the side myself. I had pushed to the side um, and, and getting to have experiences with lovers that I wanted to have. So a few years ago, I just started challenging myself, like, I'm going to have 10 sexual firsts this year. Um, and this year I upped it to 15. I'm like, I'm going to up the ante this year. I'm going to do 15 this year. And I did like one on New Year's Day, uh, maybe two. Um, <laughs> Congratulations. So it started the year off right. But, you know, for me, it's, it's, about, it's a playful thing that I do with myself mm-hmm. um, and with lovers uh, where I just get to honor that there's always so much more to explore and so much more fun to have if we let ourselves. Yeah. And I think that we get really... You know, we can get it can sex can get very rote if we aren't, mm. you know, constantly putting it back on the front burner and keeping the creativity there. Sex is one of the most creative things in the world. I mean, what's more creative than taking two cells and making a new human being out of it, right? We all start right. there. That's very creative. Um, With an orgasm to boot. Right, and hopefully, right? So, you know, I think. Um, a lot of times part of what happens is that people cease to be creative with it um, or cease to think that there are new things to learn, you know, and, and so then they just kind of plateau, you know, sexually. Um, I know more than probably 99% of the population about sexuality because it's been my life's work Mm -hmm. and there is still so much for me to learn. So I guess I just offer that as like inspiration and like encouragement of like, there's a lot more to learn, you know? And even if you're with the same partner, there's always new things to try. Um, So, you know, I think having multiple partners makes it a lot easier, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because there's different proclivities and different genders and different body parts (laughs) and different things that can be done. So, um, you know, and also, you know, you had asked about being a kinky person. You know, I also identify as a kinky person. And so I'm, I'm in a lot of kink communities um, where there's a lot of, there's more group play. There's more, um, there's just more play, you know, a lot of play, like very conscious play with power. Um, mm. And I think that actually some of my most, I would say, spiritual um, and deepest experiences sexually have been in more of my, my kinky play and my hmm. experiences with that. And so, so all that to say, because of all these ways that I identify and have arranged my life, there's a lot of opportunity for me to have new experiences. Sure. Um, and that, that may not feel the same for someone who's in a long-term monogamous relationship, but there's still lots of new things you could be doing. But we have to be open to it. And I think we have to give ourselves permission. Mm. So, yeah. Do you mind if I ask, not necessarily what you did, but what, you, what was revealed to you in terms of what was profound in your kinky experience or experience with kink that you felt was a real eye opener or possibly even a heart opener to you? Well, I think that you know, it's very powerful when you, you give up power to someone or when you have power over someone, who, which is being offered to you. You know, and so when you play with that in a really conscious way, um, you learn a lot about yourself. Mm. Um, And I think 
you know, part of what I also like about, there's a few things, you know, I think to mention, you know, one to me is that, you know, I'm a, I'm a ritualist. Um, uh, I've been on a part of many spiritual communities and I've been on a spiritual path my whole life. Um, and I think that a lot of what is really special about like BDSM um, and kink is that you can really create a ritual space right and the whole point of a ritual space is that you can you can do something with intention so BDSM you can, is uh, let me get it all bondage uh, discipline dominance submission sadism masochism so not everyone is into all of those things you might be into like one little part of that thing you're like I like some bondage once in a while that's great you know and so then that's that's your corner of that um, so but it's 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 a lot about playing with power um, looking at power exchange very differently. Sometimes there's a lot of role play involved. Mm -hmm. And I think when, when I step into a role, like I get to learn something new about myself, mm -hmm. you know? And BDSM allows a space where some of the things that we might, might keep in shadow or the things that we're like, ooh, that feels like, like I don't wanna be a bully, you know? I don't wanna be mean to people, right? But like it might be really welcome in this space. And so you can kind of bring that out of shadow and like mm. get the bully on in a role or you know with someone who will really enjoy that and appreciate that and the dynamic has been set up for that um, and so I think all of the negotiation that goes into creating an experience like that um, is also part of, of that because there's such a high level of communication um, that is really necessary mm. um, for that to go well and for people's needs to be taken care of and then things happen that you don't expect sometimes really wonderful things and sometimes like, oh, wow, ooh, we, we, we stepped on a landmine there. Like, let's figure out what that is, you know? And then something can be, can be healed. Um, hmm. So there's just so much consciousness that goes into it that I think a lot of people don't always have about sex and play. Hmm. Um, and there's a lot of play, you know? It like puts the P back in play. Hmm. It's like we're creating an adult playground where we could play roles or wear costumes or play in a particular kind of way that's erotic for us and that's fully allowable and, and permissible and we get to really revel in that. And so that's, that's part of what I really love about it. And mm -hmm. there's so much evolution that happens in all of that. Mm -hmm. It must be great freedom just in giving yourself that permission. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, beautiful. So I think this conversation leads right into this movie that has been just rocking this country, certainly, the Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, there's a lot of pro and con around it, you know, about, give us your, you know, your hit on it. What's your, what's your pro for it and what's, what's, what's the con that you have around it? Because it's really created a lot of excitement and flurry and, and all kinds of reactions. Yeah. But the fact that it's done that around the sexual conversation, I think, in and of itself is a positive thing. Yeah. yeah. I am grateful for the conversation that it has evoked. Uh, I think that that's really what to me is the is the really like crucial important thing is that more people are are talking about sex and and desires that are outside of um, the norm a very narrow norm um, and exploring that and getting a lot more permission to explore that um, and talking about more kinky sex you know in an open way that is exciting. You know that 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 has happened um, you know I have a lot of friends who own uh, sex positive feminist sex toy shops and sales are way up everyone got raises it's supporting businesses that I care about um, and that I think should be supported um, so I think it has done a lot to kind of move these conversations into more of the mainstream um, so that's that's the positive um, and I think it's awakened, you know, something in people. And, and I think part of it is just the like, oh, that's possible, you know, or I could, I could have something like that. Um, you know, there's really a piece around permission. You know, in my forthcoming book, there's a whole chapter on permission. Um, that is one of my nine elements because I think there's so much that people need around that. And in the coaching work I do with my clients, so much of what I do is give people permission. Um, not because they need it for me, just because they need it period. Mm. And then ultimately it's about them giving themselves permission. So I think there's been, there's been some shift there where people have more permission to like, 
want to play with power and want things outside the norm and what would it be like to submit to someone or what would it be like to dominate someone or to to discover what's in in those roles for me uh, and so I think that's great um, as far as the execution of that in terms of the story and the film uh, I'm not a fan uh, I I think there's a lot of problems with with the way the story has been written and and I did see the film this week um, and actually, I'm producing my own video about it in response to really? it. Really? Uh, we just shot that the other day. But, uh, you know, it. There, I think there's some, some harmful things in the film in terms of um, promoting this idea that people are into BDSM or kinky sex because they've been abused as children. And that's just simply not true. Um, mm -hmm. There's not a higher incidence of people mm -hmm who are into BDSM versus people who are not, who have either been abused or been abusers. Um, and so I think that's that's a really dangerous one to because some people, when they don't understand BDSM, equate it to violence, and it's not violence. It's, it's playing with sensation. It's playing with power and control. Um, and so I think we see some of that in the film, but we don't really get a clear idea of like, well, what is Christian's orientation to that? Um, what is his orientation to to uh, inflicting pain on someone or inflicting the sensation on someone. You know, we, a lot of times in the BDSM community, we don't even use the idea of like pleasure or pain because it's really about, it's just intense sensation. Mm -hmm. For someone that might feel like pain, for someone else it's intense, but it feels great, mm. you know? And so it's also kind of checking that a little bit in terms of how we talk about it. But uh, I don't think we get a clear sense from him, you know? And then I think that he, you know, his character and certainly how they depict it in the film, you know, as well as the book, uh, I finally had to read it because so many people were reading it. I'm like, okay, I have to know what people are talking about, you know, but I think it's sort of like he sets up all of these boundaries and then he goes back on them all, you know, like I'm not into romance and then he does all these romantic things and, you know, I, you know, I've never done this with anyone before. And so I think that's the romance thing mm. and that's the thing that I think a lot of people also are attracted to in the story of like, oh, you know, this he's awakening something in her um, but I really think that they should have hired some BDSM and kink consultants who actually know about that community and about what what that kind of play is really like and I feel like the actor perhaps could have done some more research on what that really means mm -hmm. because I think that could have been depicted much better mm -hmm. so um, so I want good. people to, it's great if you're reading smut, but like, read good smut. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of really great kinky writers out there who have been Could doing you give this us a couple a long of names? <laughs> oh my gosh, Laura Antonou, um, Midori. Um, there are lots of anthologies where there's just like tons of great short stories and just there's something for everyone's proclivities. You will, you will find it. Uh, you know, and then there's a lot of really good nonfiction books as well. There's, there's a great book called The Ultimate Guide to Kink. That's a great uh, primer if you're mm -hmm. interested in finding out about it. Um, there's the topping book and the bottoming book where you can really learn, like, what does it mean to be a top? What does it mean to be a bottom? Um, so I want people to have good resources. Um, so I hope that people don't stop at Fifty Shades and think, okay, this is my template. I hope that just leads them to, you know, want to go discover other things. Good, thank you. Yeah, I, most of your work is with women. Yeah. Uh, I'm not one. Uh, and uh, that said, what can you offer up to men who may be watching or in the audience here in terms of, because uh, I, you know, I guess on one level, uh, the sexual evolution and exploration is beyond gender. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, is there anything either peculiar to men or anything specific to men that you would you know, guide them towards that you may not in when you work with women? Yeah, I mean, I wrote a whole book for men because I wanted, uh, I wanted men to have more information about how, you know, I had been hearing so many stories from women. Um, I've had, when I've had male partners, like really great experiences, I would say across the board. Um, pretty much in my life. Maybe I've been very lucky. I've heard lots of other stories, you know, and I was like, ah, there's, there's just this piece where people are, are missing um, education about women's bodies um, in, in terms of men who partner with women. Um, and a lot of women don't actually understand, you know, and so it's also just about like, I wrote the book because I wanted to help men also help bring out of their female partners mm -hmm. what they needed. Um, because so many of us just don't know how to talk about sex. 
Um, and I think that we all kind of get really short shrift in terms of the way we're, we're sexually socialized. Um, I think men are, are socialized to um, always want sex, to know what to do, to always be the initiator, um, to be confident, um, to always have an erection, to be at the ready. And there's not enough conversation about well, what about when a man doesn't want to have sex or he's not feeling very sexual? Like, we don't hear about that a lot. We hear about that with women ad nauseum sometimes, right? Like, we, sure. we, there's sometimes too much focus on, like, oh, there's this, like, dysfunction happening. It's not necessarily dysfunction. Um, but I think that men need more permission to be able to talk about those kinds of things. Like, mm. I'm not feeling desire or I'm feeling desire for different things and I'm not sure how to ask for it. So I think there's a lot of that that goes on. Um, and I think that I think that erectile difficulties are a big thing for men. Mm -hmm. And you know, I have had male clients. I have had great guys come to me in couples. So I have definitely worked with men, and I've seen a lot of that. Uh, and I think that there's so much shame about it, and it just gets like pushed mm -hmm. underground. And it's like we're not talking about it. And and so much of how the sexual narrative goes is. And that we, the narrative we all learn, you know, is this very linear model of sex, you know, like, swing, there's an erection, um, you know, yay, arousal, excitement, you know, it's that Masters and Johnson model of, you know, you know, excitement and plateau, and now we're orgasming, and now we're going to sleep. <laughs> um, you know, but I mean, we all learn this really linear model for sex, and I think that that leaves a lot to be desired for most people. I think sex can be very circular, um, it can be very circuitous, um, there are lots of surprises. There can be lots of spontaneity in it if we allow ourselves to. Mm -hmm. But I think when we get so focused on there has to be a penis in a vagina and that's how we're doing sex and that's the main, you know, that's the main attraction mm -hmm. and everything else is just foreplay. You know, I, I wrote, you know, one of my co-author and I wrote a chapter called It's All Play, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's like all the things we call foreplay are actually a lot of fun for people and a lot of times they're the things that get women off. You know, using hands and oral sex. I mean, I think hand sex is awesome. That's one of my favorite kinds of sex. Um, so I think if we could get away from this focus on there has to be this, you know, hard, ready penis that's always, you know, ready to go, um, to go in a vagina and that that's the only way we have sex, I think that people would have a lot more fun. Um, so I think that I think men being able to explore other parts of their bodies um, is really important, and I think a lot of men want to be able to do that, um, mm -hmm. and you know, including the anus. And I think there's a lot of homophobia that goes into you know men not feeling like they can explore that, mm -hmm. um, and that's just something everyone can enjoy because there's a lot of nerve endings there, and there's a lot of sensitivity and good reasons why that's fun for people. So um, I think that we could really free ourselves up if we could get away from that very narrow idea of sex mm. and talk real, yeah. real talk yeah, about you know, those we're, things. We're, unfortunately, we're like at the end of our time here. You're having a couple of events or you know, in-person live events that you're leading. Can you share how, uh, what's going on in the near future, how people can work with you directly? Yeah, I do a few things. Uh, I, I teach a women's sexual empowerment program. Uh, it's a nine-month program where women uh, come and work with me in person in a group mm -hmm. and we cover all the things that I think are really essential and important for um, for sexual empowerment from the perspective that I work in um, I have a virtual program this year called women on fire for women who really want to work with me and might live in different parts of the world and you know or aren't able to travel um, or just want to do something right now so women on fire is, is going to be happening for most of 2015 and um, online and it'll be Skype it'll thing. be yeah by computer and, and mm -hmm. online mm -hmm. so that's a really great opportunity and then I have a claim your orgasm workshop coming up a uh, weekend workshop for women in um, April so where is that gonna be in Napa that'll be in Napa Valley beautiful Napa Valley so mm -hmm. yeah if people want are interested in any of that you can just go to you know just write to us at info at amyjoegoddard.com and and we can give you info, and there's all the information on my website as well. So, I can't believe the interview is wrapping up. I mean, it's well, like she it may flew. have to come back. Amy Joe may it have to come back. May have to come back is right. So um, we always like to close the show with what I call a pearl of wisdom. So if you had a pearl of wisdom to give to our viewers, our audience, right? Kind of 
in summation of what we talked about today, what would you like to say? And your camera is right over there. <laughs> well, I think, okay. I think the biggest thing that I'm always wanting people to understand is that sex is learned. Um, sex is not natural. Uh, we learn it. We, we learn things about sex and we explore based on the things that we learn and the things that we're told. So I think seeing sex as something that is learned and that is something that you can develop and that there are a lot of skills involved in is a way to really enhance your sexual life. So figuring out like what are the skills that I want to learn? What are the things I want to learn more about? Um, reading books, going to workshops, working with teachers or coaches or whatever so that you can actually um, build your sexual repertoire. I think a lot of times people don't know kind of what to do to juice things up or to kind of do something different. And the way to do that is to actually explore and learn new skills. And so if we can see it as something that is a lifelong journey that we're here to learn about and that is you know, an essential part of us being human, um, I think that we would have a lot more fun here on this planet Earth. So I just want to encourage you to do that. Here, here. Right. Amy Jo, thank you so much for yes. joining us. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Now it's time for one of the favorite segments, our favorite segments of the show, and that's Stu's Views. And I'm really curious, because I never know what Stu's going to be talking about for Stu's Views. So it's going to be entertaining to see how he takes today's show and give us his viewpoint. Stu? Thank you, Patricia. You're welcome. Uh, I've been very much inspired by our conversation today with Amy Jo Goddard. And we're talking about conscious sexuality, which of course is a sensuality as well. So I'm going to invite you to consider that in fact we are sensational. Because literally we are energetic beings that are nothing more than going from moment to moment sensations. So we're not an overnight sensation. We're actually moment to moment sensation. And so as we consider the possibilities for our sensations, and yes, there is nothing like the almighty orgasm. We can all admit that on some level, you know, uh, there is nothing like that. And it is one of the great miracles of existence. There are a number of others too, involving all the senses. So for example, it could be taking that, you know, that chocolate, that truffle, and just have it melt in your mouth. And I know you know what it feels like and tastes like just to enjoy the warmth that that just permeates you know, your body with. There are smells, there are roses, there is the morning coffee, <laughs> whatever it is that just makes life so much richer just simply for the ability to, to, to smell it. And the visual beauty whether it's children or a lover's eyes or whether it's a field of wildflowers or the ocean rolling in or whatever it is, the sensation of our vision is just absolutely incredible. It's amazing. And the music that we can hear and all the things that can delight us and take us to different places just simply through our, our sense of hearing is absolutely an amazing gift. And uh, this whole thing about touch, indeed. The ability to touch and be touched is absolutely incredible and amazing. So I'm inviting you all to consider, and I actually kinda want you to repeat after me in a way, and we got an audience here who gets to do the same. Now given the fact that we are truly energetic beings, beings of sensation, I want to say, and I want to hear everybody else say, I am sensational. I am sensational. You, you are sensational. You are sensational. We are sensational. We are sensational. And last but not least, life is sensational. Life is sensational. Yeah, life is sensational and it's amazing. And I know a lot of people go through a lot of stress. A lot of people go through a lot of darkness. A lot of people go through self-judgment and complete lack of permission. 
and all negative self-talk and all the rest, and we all have experiences with it. And yet I'm really inviting you to remember this. I am sensational. You are sensational. We are sensational. And life is an amazing vacation from being formless. And in that regard, life is sensational. That's it for this week's Thu's Views. And now, it's time for Patricia and her quantum quote. Thank you, Stu. That was great. Every show I do, I'm always researching the quotes online, and uh, I put in um, a conscious sexuality. I Googled it, and very little came up. I was really amazed. In fact, I, I did a lot of different words, and very, there are very few quotes that you have. I'm hoping that Amy uh, is going to, Amy Jo is going to be developing her own quotes and putting them on online like a lot of the luminaries are doing today around consciousness. We, we definitely need more quotes in that direction. But I found a wonderful quote that I definitely related to and I want to share it with you today. And it's from Margot Anand, who is a great tantric teacher and author of many books around sexuality. And I had the pleasure of hearing her speak at one point in time and she was an amazing woman. And this is her quote. She says, Truly, at the peak of orgasm, we pierce through the illusion of fragmentation and separation and glimpse the unity and the interconnectedness of all things. I'm going to read it again. Truly, at the peak of orgasm, we pierce through the illusion of fragmentation and separation and glimpse the unity and interconnectedness of all beings. I am being very transparent here and telling you that I've actually had this experience with what I call a cosmic orgasm. I've had, I've had it only twice. And in processing it after the fact, I really had a difficult time coming up with the words. I mean, there were really no words. And yet, uh, I'll try now to tell you that it was absolutely knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are all connected, that we are all one with spirit, with God, with the unknowable, unnameable, ineffable, call, source, what you will. It was no doubt whatsoever. There was no doubt. There was no separation. There was, there was a knowing. And, and, and I felt at the time, as I was having the experience, what came to me was, like a, this is like a cosmic joke that we are in what, a world where we are, appear to be separate from each other. We're not separate. We're one. We're united in spirit, and I believe through sexuality and through developing and learning our sexuality and taking it to a deeper level, we can bring ourselves closer to having that experience of union with God, with spirit, with life. So there you go. That's my quote for the day. Beautiful. Thank you. So it's like source is literally playing with itself through all of us. Right. <laughs> you might say that's true. I did. <laughs> So thank you all very much for uh, joining us today on Get Conscious Now. We really had a wonderful time and appreciate again our in-studio audience being here. And tell your friends, yes. we love to have an audience for our shows. And any parting words, Stu? I'm just grateful to be part of this conversation and just to continue to expand and wake up and enjoy what life has to offer because it truly is an incredible blessing. And thank you all for being here. And Thank you, audience and TV land, for showing up. Yep, and so we shall be close? We shall. Okay. So until next time. Until next time. Get, get conscious, conscious now. now. Welcome to State and Fig, located in historic La Arcata Plaza in downtown Santa Barbara. Our menu focuses on products that are raised in the state of California, inspired by the flavors of the Riviera. And we are proud to be sponsoring this program. I'm attorney Gregory Lowe. I will prepare your trust, bankruptcy, divorce, conservatorship, probate, evictions. All of this I can do at an affordable price and with caring. Thank you very much. When I was growing up as a kid, I used to go around with him and watch him. My mother and I both worked at Lowry Field to keep on doing this together.
Get Conscious Now is proud to be sponsored by American Riviera Bank. It's our bank, and we feel good about it. Hi, I'm Kelly Brandenburg. I've been a stylist for the last 15 years. I'm a color specialist as well as I provide a wide variety of other services. You can find me at 19 Blue Salon in the heart of downtown. I'm happy to be a sponsor of Get Conscious Now.